shake, spear, shake, spear, shake, spear, shake off them spears. That was also a dumb intro. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick Murphy. I'm one half of the Brothers Murph, and this is, you can solo that? You can solo that as a series where I go through all the games in our collections that can be soloed and I solo them for you. So as I was going through our games, one of the games that I was most surprised you could solo was Shakespeare. Hey, ha! <laughs> yes, you can solo Shakespeare. I didn't know either. It's got a little solo variant, a little blurb right at the very end there. And so I was like, gotta try that out because Shakespeare is my third favorite game of all time. And so I'm like, ooh, can I play more Shakespeare? Because Shakespeare is really best with three or more. Two players, it's okay, but you really want three. And so we don't get to play it nearly as much as we want to. So I was like, ooh, if I can solo it, maybe I can play it more. Ding, 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 ding. And Mike is a thespian. I enjoy theater. I haven't been on stage in a very long time, but I do enjoy watching theater. I do enjoy watching Shakespeare, and I enjoy watching Mike doing Shakespeare. He's very good at the these and thys and thines and thous and knowing what all they all mean. I assume they're talking about poultry. And I always thought Shakespeare was an interesting character because there's a lot of stuff that people don't know about Shakespeare. Um, a lot of people don't know that he started out writing only comedies and then he had a pivotal moment where he started writing tragedies. There was really like a catalyst type moment where he started writing tragedies. And he wrote tragedies from then on out until he died. And a lot of people don't know that Shakespeare had a brother. Uh, there was William Shakespeare, the, but there was also his brother. And apparently it was because of his brother that he started writing all these tragedies. And so like, ah, I wish we could see like what happened. Like what was it? What was it that happened between them that made Bill Shakespeare kind of go down this road into a tragedian and stuff? I God, I just, I wish we could see it, you know? To be or not to be, that Billy! is the qu Billy! Billy, Glenn. Billy, Billy. Glenn, what are you doing? Who cares? Who cares? We're in the middle of a show, we're in the middle of a performance. What are you doing? What are you doing? No, What's up? Know, What's I'm up, Glenn? Glenn Shakespeare? I'm trying to perform, we're trying to- You wanna hang out? Dreams come alive. All right, cool. See you later. Right. What? Who cares about the performance? Who cares? It sucks. Glenn. No, they're garbage. They're garbage. Don't worry about them. But you ruined my whole performance. Yeah, well, you know, you ruined my childhood, so. We got problems. What does that mean? By existing? <laughs> Thanks, Falstaff. Hilarious. Falstaff. Always hammered. Love it. Classic. Oh. Actually, got to go in a second. I got to see a guy about What, what are you wearing? Around. What is this shirt? It's yeah. red. I don't get the stars. What do you mean? It's red, white, and blue, baby. America. America. Sorry, America. America hasn't been invented yet. It exists in my heart. That's all that matters. What, what do you want? What do you want? I gotta get going. No, no. I gotta get going. I gotta see a guy about putting some subs in my Prius. What are you doing tonight? Can you drive me and the boys to the bar? Pick us up? No, I can't tonight. And because what? I've got another show. I've got a show tonight. What's the forum? No, who cares about the forum? No one cares about the forum. F fine. Fine, I'll be there. Stop reading false stuff. He reads mean to me. Real quick. No, I don't care. So that history was all true, and for this review, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do something a little bit different. So there's a solo version from the book, and then I found this other solo version on Board Game Geek, and in my opinion, it sounded more interesting than the one in the book. The one in the book is very much a beat your best score kind of solo adventure, and you know how much that annoys me. And someone made a competitive one where it's like a win or lose, there's some AI in it. And I actually played both because I was curious. So I'm actually gonna review both of those in here. In the gameplay, I'm gonna show you how to play both of them. And then in the final thoughts, we'll talk about both of them. Let's get this game, let's get this play right down to that top lay and let's see how this bad boy solos. All right, so this is the setup and overview for Shakespeare. This is, this is my Shakespeare hand. Shakespeare! <laughs> now, how I'm gonna do the gameplay videos is I'm going to explain the variant in the Shakespeare rulebook first, and then after that, I'm gonna go through and explain the Shakespeare Rivals variant that's on BGG, just to not confuse them. The first thing you can do is pick out your color and grab your player board. Two of your discs you can go ahead and throw back in the box because there is going to be no initiative and no player order tokens because you're the only one playing. You don't need anything else. You are also going to take a rival color token and put them on the fourth spot of all three acts. 
You set everything else up in the normal way. You put your disc on the first spot of all three acts. You put your spot on the first spot of the prestige track. You put your little pawn on the first round marker right here. You put a disc on your ambiance track and then put your five cylinders right down here in their spot. Set up the decks and everything else per normal. You still will need your rest tokens, so make sure to keep these nearby. You're gonna put out the appropriate set and costume pieces based on this card right here, which shows one player. Incidentally, this is also the exact same as the two player side, so you could really look at either side of what you want. But basically, there's going to be eight number ones, eight number twos, seven number threes, five number fours, four number fives, and four gold number threes. You're gonna put those in their respective bags and give them a good old shaky shake. Also, you can play with the Shakespeare Backstage expansion if you want to. It's not mentioned in their rules, but there's no reason why it shouldn't play per normal. So you can throw it in there if you want to. If you have it, if not, don't worry about it. All right, so just like a two-player game, you're going to put out six costume pieces and then six set pieces. You are also always going to skip phase one, the wager phase, which is where you secretly choose a certain amount of actions that you're going to take in that round and then compare them to everyone else but there's no one else to compare them to because you're the only one playing, so you're always gonna skip the first phase, the wager phase of the game. During the recruitment part where you put out the character cards, you're always gonna put out four cards and you're gonna get to choose whichever one of these you want and then once you choose one, the other three get discarded. So the action phase is gonna take place like it normally does. You're gonna pick however many actions you wanna do and you're gonna activate people and move things up and down and place set pieces and place costumes and do all that fancy, fancy stuff. But you get to choose how many actions you do. You can do one, you can do five, it's really up to you. Though during your activation phase, if you only place one or two cylinders and no more, you're gonna gain one prestige. The ambiance phase takes place here like it normally does. And if you didn't take any purple set pieces, you still have to go down one on the ambiance track. Okay, so dress rehearsals work in pretty much the exact same way. You're gonna look at how many actors or actresses that you have fully dressed, and then you're gonna do what's in the bottom right corner of each of their cards. In this situation, Cleopatra is going to make me go up one on the first act track, and Viola here is going to give me two pounds. Woo! For act two, where the player who is in first place gets two prestige, and the player who's in second place gets one prestige, you compare yourself against this neutral token here. So if you're here, you're going to get two prestige. If you're not, you're only going to get one. You might be wondering what these two neutral tokens do on the first and third act. And really, they do nothing unless you draw this objective card at some point during the game. This one says that anytime you're in first in any of the three acts, you gain one prestige. So you would then compare yourself to these neutral tokens. But if you don't have this card, you're frankly never going to use these. But you have to have them out there just in case you do draw this card. Once the first dress rehearsal for round four is done, you're going to put all the neutral discs on the eighth spot on each of the acts, and then these are the ones you're gonna to have to beat during the dress rehearsal during the sixth day. And then the very last phase, the rest phase, you still have to rest all but one of the people you used in that last turn, and then you start all over again and keep on going. So once you get done with the final dress rehearsal in the sixth day, the game is over. The game scores like a normal game does. You check and see what your prestige is. You score any end game objective cards that you have. You also still have to pay all of your people. So if you can't pay your people, you go down to prestige. Down is this way. And then you see how you did. This is a beat your own best score kind of variant, which Nick doesn't like. I like the other way better. But see how you did? See if you can beat your best score. Why not? And that is how you play Shakespeare solo. Okay, this is the setup for the Shakespeare Rivals variant that is on BGG. This was put forth on BoardGameGeek.com by a Mr. Don Riddle. Thank you, Mr. Don Riddle. This variant is way better. <gasps> Spoilers! So in the Shakespeare Rivals version, you are going to be going up against a rival playwright named Ben Johnson, or BJ for short. So they're going to have their own player board over here with their own color. So the Shakespeare Rivals setup works in pretty much the exact same way with some slight differences. Number one being, BJ is going to start off with 12 pounds in his bank. You're going to put one of his colored discs in the middle of his ambiance track. 
and then one of his colored discs on number five of the prestige track and then his colored discs are also going to go on the number four spot on the track which is the same as the normal game all his other discs and cylinders are going to throw back in the box you're not going to need them in this variant the setup for the set and costume pieces is going to be exactly the same in the rivals version as it is in the normal version it's going to be eight eight seven five four four throw in the bag give him a shake after you recruit the card that you would like bj is always going to take the leftmost card and put it in his little area over here and then all the other cards are going to get discarded but if you ever have to discard any actors or actresses for every actor or actress that you do discard his ambiance is going to go up by that many if the card BJ is going to take is a craftsperson, like an assistant or a seamstress or a set dresser, you then have to look and see if he has more craftsmen than actors or actresses. In this situation, he has two seamstresses, but only one actress. So in that situation, if you're going to take another craft person, you have to then flip them over into an extra. And you keep doing that until your actors and actresses outnumber your craftspeople. And just like the normal version, if you only place one, or two actions, you're gonna get a prestige in this variant as well. BJ does his ambiance phase just like you. He goes up and down on this track and he gets whatever reward or punishment he gets for wherever he is. And then after the ambiance phase, there's something called BJ's turn. On BJ's turn, what happens is that he's gonna take all of the leftover costumes and set pieces and then he gets to put them on his board. Now by he, I mean you, you have to do it, but you do get to choose where they go. So you're going to take all the costume pieces and spread them out or do whatever the heck you want. And, and then after that, you're going to take the set pieces and put them on his board as well. Though you do still have to follow the normal set rules in terms of everything being symmetrical. If there's ever a situation where you can't place a costume piece or a set piece, you just discard it from the game. BJ never gets the bonuses you get when you put down a set piece, but he does get the prestige if you cover up one of these prestige spots. He also does get the money and prestige bonuses for filling out his costumes. So again, it's up to you where you put them. You probably want to give him the lesser bonuses. Don't go ahead and give him three prestige. He's hard enough to beat as it is. Dress rehearsal against BJ takes place more or less like a normal one does. You're going to see who you have dressed and move on this... You're going to see who you have dressed and move on the axe accordingly. And then you're going to see who BJ has completely dressed and you're going to move him on the axe accordingly. He always starts here. So in this situation, he would get one prestige and move up one on the blue track. Once the dress rehearsal for round four is finished, all of BJ's discs are going to get to move up one more spot. And just like in a normal game, at the end of the sixth day, the second dress rehearsal, the final dress before you put on a show for the queen, you score in the exact same way, with one difference. You always draw the top two cards of the objective deck and see if BJ met them. He may, he may not, you just kind of have to see. And then everything else scores in the same way. BJ does have to pay all the people he has, but that's one of the reasons why he starts with that 12 pounds in the beginning to give him kind of a head start on that. And then after that, you see if you beat BJ, you see if you beat your rival playwright. Chances are you probably didn't. He's really, really good at this game. He good at writing damn plays. And that is how you play Shakespeare Rivals. So that was so what do I think about both of these? I'll put it out there. It's neither one is my favorite ever, but I will say the competitive one with the win-lose condition is eons better than the other one. It should replace the one in the book. They should reprint the whole thing and just put that one in there. And I want to make sure I give a shout out to the person who made it on Board Game Geek. It's Riddle13, Don Riddle. So give that person a thumbs up or some geek gold. I still don't know what geek gold does, but give it to them. It's a, it's a good variant, honestly. It really, really is. Ultimately, what it comes down to with both of them is the solo variant of this game can't be that good, in my opinion, because so much of what makes Shakespeare good is like the auction in the beginning, where you're auctioning how many actions you're going to take. In a normal multiplayer game of Shakespeare, at the beginning, the first phase, I believe it's called the wager phase, everyone picks how many actions they're going to take secretly, puts it in their palm, and then simultaneously reveals how many they're going to do. And then turn order takes place in who chose the fewest actions goes first and then so on and so forth down the line. 
And that's a big deal because Shakespeare to me is like the quintessential game of, I have 15 things I need to do and I can do two of them. So what do I need to do? And what do I just need to do? And that's this kind of game. And that auction part is such a big part of it because you can take five actions, but you're like, oh, but if I choose five, I'm gonna be going last. And in this game, that is detrimental a lot of times. So particularly if you're going into one of the dress rehearsal or the final dress rehearsal, you really need to get those people costumed and on the stage. And if you can't do it, man, that can cost you the game because this game almost always is separated by a point or two. It's a very, very, very tight game. And the thing that makes it so tight is that auction mechanic. I really do think that. And without that, no matter what you do in the solo variant, it's just, it loses a lot of the luster of the game and a lot of the tension of a really good worker placement game. Without it, it's just not really that. And especially the one that comes in the book. There is none of that. I just feel like there is never, ever any contention. You can just choose however many actions you want and like yeah you get one extra prestige if you choose one or two actions and that's it but it just feels like there's no urgency to do that and again part of that is it's just beat your highest score so i have no incentive to be like "Ooh, i'm gonna make this sacrifice so i get a higher score i just don't care i don't care at all particularly where it comes down to is like the costumes and the set pieces that is a such a massive part of this game is like only choosing to do two actions so that you go first so you can grab the costumes before anybody else. That's a big, big part of this game. Same with the set. And in this, you're always going first, so there's no contention for that. You're just kind of like, all right, I'm just gonna take all the costumes I need. It was so easy to costume all of my people. That has never, ever happened in my entire life in this game. Usually that's the most stressful part. And it was so easy. It was easy to get money. It was easy to do this. It was just easy, easy, easy. Okay, so that's the base game version. Let's talk about Don Riddle's version. The Don Riddle version is much better because you do have the AI character and that AI character forces you to choose some certain things. You're still the first one to go every single time. So you still have first pick of the sets, first pick of the costumes, you got the big beautiful hats, whatever you want, all that kind of stuff, that's great. But anything that's left over is going to BJ. And that's kind of a big deal because you're not gonna be able to take everything. You're not gonna be able to take half all that stuff. So like. He is gonna build his set super big. All his people are gonna be super costumed. And you really have to decide like, ooh, what pieces do I wanna take? Do I wanna take a bunch of small costumes so that he takes the bigger costumes but not nearly as many? That's one tactic I employed in one of my games was he had a whole ton of actors and actresses and the whole time he was only ever getting a couple costume pieces and you're the one who decides where they go on his actors and actresses. And I was able to spread them out so that only, I think by the end of the game, only two of his actors and actresses were fully clothed to the point where they could rehearse in the final dress rehearsal. And that was kind of cool. And I was able to think it through and really like manipulate the situation and beat the AI character in that sense. Now, even in that game, I lost by like eight points. It is really, really hard to beat the bot, BJ, the AI character. I haven't done it. Man, it is rough. So overall, the Don Riddle competitive one is way better, if for nothing else, because it has a win-lose condition. That's all that matters to me for the most part. But the rest of it does play way better. There's more strategy, there's more thinking, there's more doing things for certain reasons. Overall, this is not my favorite game to solo. Of the ones I've done, it's pr pretty much near the bottom. And the main reason for that is, is because so much of the game is based around trying to decide how many actions to take so that you can go in the proper order that you need to, to get the things that you need to. And without that, this game is not as good. And so ultimately Shakespeare, eh, I probably won't play it again, um, unless I absolutely have to. And so that's okay, you know, not everyone's gonna be a winner. I do give it up to Don Riddle. Thank you so much for coming out with a better version of the solo variant. And that's gonna be it for me. Until next time, check us out on all forms of social media, which is gonna be right here. Boop. Check out This Game is Broken, which is a comedy board game panel podcast show right here. Boop. And please check us out on Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash thebrothersmurf, which is right here. Boop. We stream there at least twice a week. Check us out, it's super, super fun. We have a really great community on Twitch and we're just having the best time of our lives talking with people while we play games. It's like having a whole bunch of people in the room. It's wonderful. So check us out on all those different places all around the screen. So until next time, this has been You Can Solo That?
Shakespeare edition.